So good morning. Um, hope everyone's had their coffee. We've got a lot to cover here. Um, I'm glad we got started pretty quickly, so we should be good. So I realized that the term uh, static metaprogramming probably requires a little bit of um, explanation. So how many people know what metaprogramming is? So a pretty good chunk of you. Um, so metaprogramming is basically writing programs that manipulate either themselves or other programs as data. And usually when we talk about metaprogramming, we're talking about things like um, you know, hooking getters and setters and customizing method dispatch. Uh, languages like Ruby and Smalltalk really allow you to kind of reach into the runtime and do some funky things. What I want to talk about today is not this kind of metaprogramming, but rather programs that manipulate code. So that's kind of a different type of metaprogramming, which um, some people call static metaprogramming. Um, so a thing that manipulates code, a compiler is actually a really good example of that. Um, right? A compiler is a thing that takes code in and outputs code. Now, normally a compiler is something that takes in some sort of high-level code and outputs something lower level. So a C++ compiler you know, spits out machine code. Um, and a Java compiler spits out Java bytecode. Um, but you, know, you can also compile to another high-level language. Um, probably a lot of you are familiar with CoffeeScript, right, which just compiles to JavaScript. And there's a ton of other languages that do this. Um, people sometimes call these transpilers. It's basically just a compiler. It's the same thing. So a compiler basically consists of two main parts. The first thing is the parser. So the parser takes source code, and it creates some sort of structured representation of that source code. Usually, we call this a parse tree, uh, or an abstract syntax tree. And the second main part of a compiler is the code generator. So the code generator takes a parse tree, um, you know, does some analysis on it, walks over it, and spits out the object code. Now, of course, this is, this is a pretty big simplification. Um, in particular, there's usually a lot of stuff that happens in that middle step there of analysis and optimization, those things. Um, but like I said, you know, we, don't, we, we don't always have to compile from a high-level language to a low-level language. We can compile um, you know, to another high-level language, or we can compile to the same language that we started with. And this is uh, what I want to talk about next. So I'm going to show you some examples of using a JavaScript compiler called Esprima. Now, Esprima is a nice, simple, fast compiler for JavaScript, but it's also written in JavaScript, which is kind of cool. Um, so you can, you can dive in and check out the source and understand what it's doing. And Esprima also has um, two related modules, um, ES Traverse and ES Code Gen. So, so ES Traverse is a module for traversing the parse trees that are generated by Esprima. And ES Code Gen is for doing code generation from the parse trees. And we're going to use both of these in the examples uh, that I'm going to show you. So this is a really, really simple example of what you can do with Esprima. It has a nice, simple API. right? We require Esprima or include the source tag and uh, just call the parse function. So this is a very, very simple JavaScript program here, right? a single function that returns a value. Um, Esprima is going to emit a parse tree that looks something like this. This is a bit of a simplification, but um, at the top level, we have a program. The program consists of one thing, a function declaration. The function declaration has an identifier, uh, the name of the function, and it has a body. The body has one thing, which is a return statement, and it returns 42. So this is sort of a simplified version. Um, if you want to see it in its full glory, I'm not sure if that's big enough to read, but um, you get the picture. It's, you know, there's a lot of detail there to the parse tree. So on its own, this is a little bit boring, right? OK, so we parse JavaScript and we get a parse tree. Who cares? <clears throat> um, but it turns out that if we, if we actually do stuff to this parse tree, we can, we can analyze it and do a lot of useful and really interesting things. And I'm going to show a basic example here, um, which is to do a style checker. So this is sort of an example of how something like JSLint works. <clears throat> um, so as Brian mentioned, I work on the Chrome team at Google. 
And on the Chromium project, we have uh, style guides. And we have a C++ style guide and a JavaScript style guide. And they're not quite the same. Um, variables in C++ have underscores, and in JavaScript, we use camel case. So I find myself getting mixed up sometimes between these style guides. And you know, it really wastes a lot of time in code review when you realize that you used underscores when you should have used camel case. So I wrote a style checker that, can, that I can run as a pre-commit hook to prevent me from making these mistakes. And I'll show you uh, just how easy it is to do this with Esprima. So that's basically the code right there. It's about 15 lines of code. Um, and it's really pretty simple. So the first thing we do is um, just call the Esprima parse function to, to parse, the, parse the code and get back an abstract syntax tree. And uh, then we use the ES traverse module to walk over the syntax tree. Um, now, ES traverse can basically does a depth first traversal of a parse tree. And you can visit each node either on the way down before you visit its subtrees or on the way up. And, and in this case, we're doing it on the way down. It's not really relevant, but that's just uh, the meaning of the, the enter, um, why we're using enter there. <clears throat> So this function that we have here is going to be called for every node. And we're just looking for nodes that are variable declarations. And when we find that node, we're going to call the check variable names function. And again, this is pretty simple. Um, so a variable declaration can have more than one variable that it declares, right? So we're going to iterate through each of those. And we're just going to call a function for every single one. And I'm basically just looking to see if the name of the variable has an underscore in it. And if it does, that's an error that I want to report. So I'm just going to push this errors object uh, to an array. And at the end of the script, I report all the errors that were found. So that's it. Uh, really, really simple and short. Now I have some sample code here that I want to test against. And if I run this script on that code, lo and behold, it detects the errors um, and, and, and spits me out a warning. So this is. Uh, just a really simple example of the kind of style checks you can do. Um, as I said, you know, this is basically the way JSLint works. Um, and so if you have a style guide in your project, you, know, you could imagine writing uh, a style checker that will check every single aspect of your style guide. And it's really not that complicated to do. So this is an example of um, analyzing the parse tree. Right? So we read in the code, we analyzed the parse tree, but we left the original code intact. So the next thing I want to do is something a little bit more interesting, which is to actually rewrite the source code. And what I'm going to do is, um, I find, so I find often when I'm developing, I'm trying to understand the flow of my code and how it flows between functions. And especially if I have a lot of callbacks, um, it can get really complicated. And I like to insert logging statements. And probably a lot of people do this. But sometimes it's super annoying to have to go and insert logging statements in like 10 or 15 different places. So I wrote this little script um, that basically adds logging to every single function in a particular source file. And again, it's actually surprisingly simple to do this. Um, so again, we, we first take the source code and we parse it into an abstract syntax tree. Uh, then we're going to walk over that tree and look for particular nodes. So this time we're looking for function declaration nodes and function expressions. And when we find one, we just call this, this function add before code. So this function is a little bit more complex than we had before. You know, we're not just reporting errors. Um, so first we figure out the name of the function. Um, and then what I do in the second line here is to build up a string um, that contains the code that I want to insert at the beginning of every function. So it's just a console.log statement um, with the name of the function. But you could do some more sophisticated stuff here with um, you know, printing the values of the arguments to the function. Now, the, the next line is, is interesting. Um, I'm actually going to take this string that I built up and use a Sprema to parse it. And so I'm going to have a little parse tree, a very, very tiny parse tree, um, that I'm going to use and insert into the original parse tree. So to get an idea of um, what, what we're doing here, the original parse tree is something like this. Um, we have a function declaration, 
Uh, its body is a block statement, um, and that has a body which is an array of statements. And those statements represent basically every single line in the function. Um, so my mini parse tree that I created from that string that I built up is actually just a single statement object. And I'm going to take that, and I'm going to add it to the array at the beginning of the array uh, that represents the body of the original function. So I've modified the original parse tree here. Um, and then the next step to actually do something useful now that I've modified the parse tree is to emit, uh, emit code. So using the ES code gen um, module, I actually generate new source code from the, original, from the modified parse tree. So I, I took in the original code, modified the parse tree, and I'm spitting out some new JavaScript. And then I can you know, run that JavaScript, and it's going to log um, all the function enters. So uh, just a simple example to show you what this is doing here. Right? Here's a simple, uh, simple snippet of code that contains two functions. Um, and if I run my little script on this, it uh, spits out some new code that looks almost the same, except for the fact that it's got these console.log statements at the beginning of each function. And this is done completely automatically, right? So I could, I could do this across a, a thousand source files if I wanted. So this kind of stuff is really, really powerful, I think, for doing the kinds of um, things that maybe you know, Java people will do with, with Eclipse refactoring tools. Um, I've shown just a couple examples here, but really there's kind of no limit to what you can do um, when you're manipulating these parse trees. But these were all examples of um, basically co compiling from JavaScript to JavaScript. So I want to get into something a little different, which is what if our source language is not JavaScript? Maybe some of you, you know, have always dreamed of um, creating your own language, something like CoffeeScript maybe that compiles to JavaScript, right? It's a really, really s simple and powerful way to create a new language and to play with language concepts. And for that, I'm going to show you uh, how you can use parser generators. So parser generators, a parser generator is basically a thing that takes a language grammar as input. So a language grammar is just you know, a formal description of a language. And uh, it spits out a parser that will parse that language. And you've probably heard of um, some of the more famous uh, parser generators, uh, Yak, Bison, or in JavaScript, there's Jison. Um, but today, I'm going to show you an example of, of uh, something called peg.js, which, which is a slightly different kind of parser generator uh, that uses parsing expression grammars, which I'm going to explain very briefly. So let's talk about these grammars. It's basically, um, you know, if you're going to write a new language, you kind of need to know how to deal with formal grammars. So how many people are familiar with uh, this kind of syntax for context-free grammars? OK, so quite a few of you. This is basically a meta language. It's a language for describing languages. And if you're designing your own language or you're even looking at other languages, this is the kind of thing that you'll see quite a bit. Um, what I have here is an example of recognizing an arithmetic language. So um, basically just sort of math expressions. Um, you can have numbers. Uh, you can have plus or minus operators, uh, multiplication, division, and brackets. <clears throat> And uh, you'll see, if you're familiar with regular expressions, you'll see that uh, some of the similar syntax is used in context-free grammars. Now, may maybe you've seen these in slightly different forms. There's Bacchus nor form and EBNF. Um, they're slightly different, but they're really just different representations of the same thing. So this is the form that I'm going to use today. <clears throat> um, but first, I want to talk about one particular thing um, this little, this, what we call the choice operator. So this is, basically works like a logical or in uh, most programming languages. Except the one difference is that in context-free grammars, um, it's actually unordered. So um, it's not like a short-circuiting operator like you have in programming languages. And this is because context-free grammars come from linguistics, actually. 
Um, you know, they weren't computer scientists who originally came up with these things. And implementing unordered choice, uh, it can be a bit of a pain, and sometimes you have language ambiguities. Um, so there's a, a slightly different variation called parsing expression grammars, and that's what we're going to use today. And uh, pegs use ordered choice. So it's, it's just like the logical operator in a programming language. So if the, if the first option is used, then we don't even bother looking at the second option. And uh, to indicate that the operator is ordered choice, they usually use a slash instead of uh, the vertical bar. But it's, it's a minor, minor syntax difference. Um, <clears throat> so let's take a look at what it looks like to use peg.js to parse this arithmetic language that we have. So you can just take the string and uh, call the build parser function. Um, and it will return you an object, which is a parser. And then I can use this parser, just like I use the Esprima parser to parse JS, I can use this parser to parse my new language. Um, and if I, if I try and test out this code, so try and parse 1 plus 10, I actually get an error. And this is something that if you use parsing expression grammars, a lot of people are going to run into this the first time they try something. Um, and it's an error about left recursion. And I think it's worth explaining why this happens, because so many people run into it. It's actually very simple. Um, so a lot of parsing expression grammars, or tools to work with parsing expression grammars, use what's called a recursive descent parser. And a recursive descent parser basically treats uh, each one of these rules, so the things along the left-hand side here, uh, also called non-terminals, it treats those just as functions. So basically, um, the, the two things in blue there, these are just function calls, effectively. And you know, if you've ever written a recursive function that calls itself as the first line of that function, then you probably understand why this is not going to work, right? It's, it's, it's simply just infinite recursion. It keeps trying to satisfy the expression by, by itself. So that's why you can't use left recursion in a recursive descent parser. Um, but it's actually quite simple to fix. And a lot of people tear their hair out about how to deal with left recursion. Um, but, but the real simple fix is that you just use iteration instead of recursion. Right? And this is something that, that a lot of people know from programming, that you can rewrite almost any recursive algorithm as being an iterative algorithm. Um, but a lot of people kind of forget this when it deals with when, the, when it comes to language grammars. So to use uh, iteration in, in, this, in this grammar, we just have to use the star operator. Um, and this is just like a regular expression. So star means you can have zero or more um, repetitions of whatever's inside the brackets there. So now that we've fixed our grammar, let's try parsing the new grammar. And yay, it parses and everything, all is good. Um, except you may notice that it's this, this parse tree that it generates here is kind of weird. Um, it's, it's like just a bunch of nested arrays. And it's not like that nice parse tree that we saw from Esprima that had all this great information. And you may also notice that the number 10 up here uh, got parsed as like separate digits. So this is kind of weird, right? I, I, it's a little bit hard to work with if, if you have to visit, e like look at each number individually. So let's look at how we can fix that. We can fix this using something called semantic actions. So peg.js basically allows you to embed little snippets of JavaScript code um, inside any of your rules. And you can use these to customize how it builds the parse tree. So we're going to uh, edit our number, our number rule down here. And we're going to add this identifier digits. So we, we have a name with which to refer to the things that got captured. And then we just add a little snippet of JavaScript code to join those digits together into a single string. And that's going to make it much easier to work with. And when I run the parser again, I see that it looks much nicer. I've got you know, the number 10 there um, rather than the individual digits. Um, another thing that can be useful uh, in, when you're working with peg.js is to insert 
a snippet of code at the top of your function. Some of your semantic actions may require you know, helper functions or whatever. So what you can do is actually just put brackets at the top of your uh, grammar and insert whatever JavaScript code you want. So maybe instead of just returning a string to represent my numbers, maybe I want to actually build up a real parse tree, right? So I can introduce uh, a constructor function here that will create a node, and then in my semantic action, I can use that constructor to, to create my nodes in the parse tree. So that's really all there is to uh, parsing a simple language in peg.js. Um, but you know, this language doesn't really do anything, right? It's just we, we, we parsed some numbers and operators, but how do we do something useful with it? So I promised in my, um, <clears throat> Brian just held up the five-minute five minute sign for me, and I promised that I could uh, teach you how to create your own language that compiles to JavaScript in five minutes. So it's perfect timing, and I think I can do it. <laughs> um, so let's start with the, the arithmetic grammar that we had before. Um, we're going to throw away all the stuff that we don't need, because that arithmetic grammar works. It's still part of our grammar. I'm just going to hide it right now. Um, at the top level, we have an expression. So I want to introduce a new top-level uh, rule here for my new language. Um, and that rule is for variable declarations. And I've just used decl here for short. Um, and what I want to do is have variable declarations that are in the style of small talk. I don't know if anyone's familiar with small talk, but rather than saying var x equals whatever, um, small talk uses colon equals um, for, it actually uses it for assignment, but in this case, I'm going to use it for variable declaration and assignment. Uh, so a declaration consists of an identifier, colon equals, and then an expression. So let's define identifier. An identifier is just like JavaScript. It can be any sequence of digits, letters, or underscore. Um, a digit, the number 0 to 9. Letters are A to Z in lowercase and capital. And notice I said Z, so I really am Canadian. <laughs> and we're going to throw in a new top-level rule here, um, because we want to have multiple expressions in this language, right? Our old grammar only handled one expression. Um, so our program, in this case, can consist of, well, it can consist of nothing, actually, or it can be one or more expressions that are separated by a period. So Smalltalk um, uses a period, kind of like JavaScript uses the semicolon, right? And, and I'm a big Smalltalk fan, so I'm going to use that uh, in my language. So let's take a look at what this looks like now when we try and parse a little snippet of code with it. Um, so I'm just going to parse something simple, you know, x equals 2 plus 5 and y equals 3. And it works, which is, which is cool. Again, we have this really nasty looking parse tree that it's kind of hard to do anything useful with. Um, so we can use semantic actions to fix that. Now, when you're trying to write a language that compiles to JavaScript, there's kind of two approaches you can take. If you're really making a full-fledged language, what you probably want to do is actually build up a parse tree and then have a separate code generation phase where you walk over the parse tree and generate the code. But um, I'm going to kind of cheat here. And because my language really kind of maps to the same semantics as JavaScript, um, I'm just going to build up JavaScript strings, and then at the end, concatenate them all together, and I'm going to have my program. So that's what I'm doing for the variable declarations here. I'm basically just building up a string uh, that begins with var, inserts the, the variable name, puts the equal sign and the expression, and a semicolon. And when I parse my little example, looks much better, right? So, so you can see I've actually got like, you know, something is starting to look like a, like a JavaScript variable declaration there. I just need to clean up a, a few other things. And just like before, we can use semantic actions to clean up the parse tree. So I'm going to um, concatenate everything together in, in an expression and flatten it. Um, and it's getting better. So now, now I actually have uh, a full, basically valid, variable declaration there. And I'll do the same for the pro at the program rule uh, to basically clean up the rest of it. And bam, I actually, you know, 
There we've actually compiled a language which is not JavaScript, although it resembles it, uh, into valid JavaScript. <laughs> so this is not quite a Turing complete language, so maybe I've cheated a little bit here. Um, but you can imagine it's, it's really not that hard to add in um, things like if statements and loops. So if any of you have thought, like, you know, I really want to design my own language, but I wouldn't know where to begin, I encourage you to go home. You can sit down and write something like this, a full language, easily in a day. Um, so I hope I've, you know, encouraged you to see compilers as not being just this tool that, that kind of you, you use but never look at, but, but they're actually something useful that you can use to do things, you know, both in JavaScript or if you're looking for, um, you know, if you've always wanted to design your own language. And I see people sometimes using, you know, uh, grep and, and regular expressions to do things, and I just want to, like, you know, tell them, like, don't do it. It's so, it's so error prone. It's really not that hard to um, write a simple parser for simple languages. So if you like more information, I encourage you guys to go check out um, Esprima uh, and peg.js. Peg.js is still uh, pretty early on, and I, and I think you know, they love contributors and people reporting bugs. Um, and if you'd like to see more details on the code that I showed, uh, it's up on GitHub. You can check it out there. And uh, there's also a URL for my slides. So thanks. Oh, and I should add, if you have any questions, please come see me after the talk. Thanks. Awesome. That was awesome.